remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again here for another week of eye-gouging, crotch-kicking, no-holds-barred political commentary right here on TruthFrequencyRadio.com, 90.7 FM in Denver, 97.3 FM out in Eugene, Oregon. Great to be back with you once again, and uh, again, as we've done uh, on occasion here, we have the cameras in the studio with us today, at least uh, for this segment of the radio broadcast and we do this from time to time when we are going to be discussing an issue that has a kind of particular importance nationally something that is going to be a very big issue that people are going to be talking about uh, for a long time we feel like in kind of one of those critical discussions at this point in American history when we come to one of those topics we bring the, the cameras in here so we can videotape it and put it out on YouTube in addition to the radio show that gives us an opportunity to kind of expand the discussion beyond just truthfrequencyradio.com. So uh, you can go to my uh, YouTube page, it's America's Evil Genius, all one word, and see the video of this and uh, share that with your friends and so forth. The reason we're doing all of that this week is because of uh, the topic that we're going to discuss in this first segment. Um, you know, a lot of people, when they do radio shows, or they do blogs, or they do newspaper columns, or maybe they appear on on cable news a lot of those people kind of base their operations out of a place like washington or uh, washington dc new york city los angeles something like that and the reason that most of them base their operations out of places like that is because they figure that when a big news story goes down when a big controversy erupts and something noteworthy happens they will be right there in the thick of it while it's going on and thereby they'll be able to provide a bit of a, of, of a better or more well-rounded perspective from ground level than anybody else will be able to provide. And clearly, there's uh, some consideration to be given to that. But as those of you who have been uh, listening to this show for a long time know, uh, we do not have that advantage here because we record this show out of the St. Louis, Missouri metro area. So in theory, we don't really have that same advantage that people who broadcast their shows out of Washington, D.C. or New York or somewhere have? Well, at least in theory. Because in the last year or so, we have found ourselves here in the Midwest, in the middle of America, we have found ourselves in this very studio, smack dab in the middle of some of the most interesting and consequential and controversial news stories that our nation has seen in a long time. You remember back when all the Ferguson controversy and Michael Brown, all that happened. That happened over in Ferguson, just a, a short few miles from this very studio. And we were able to provide a perspective to you on that show that, dare I say it, I'm not sure anybody else on this network or a lot of other places could provide because we were right in the middle of it. We lived with the repercussions of it every day. We still are. And we find ourselves after the last, oh, 24 to 48 hours in this very studio in another similar situation. No doubt by now most of you have heard that the University of Missouri football team, the Tigers, had boycotted football related activities and practices and perhaps even games in protest of some racial issues on campus and for the demands that the uh, university system president uh, stand down, that he resign. That's, that's a pretty big deal. <laughs> that's a pretty big deal. And it was a pretty big deal that happened right here in our backyard. I mean, I can walk out of this studio right now and get into my truck, and in an hour and a half, I'm on the Mizzou campus. So, again, another major story, interesting story that everybody in the country is talking about around their water cooler happening practically in our backyard. So it's particularly particularly interesting to us here. In addition, there was a group called Concerned Citizens Concerned Students 1950 
out there that had kind of taken the mantle of the protests on this thing. 1950 being a reference to the first year that a black student was ever admitted to the University of Missouri. And so they put that in their name. And so that the idea is that they are uh, protesting in favor of or fighting for the uh, oppression that every black student since 1950 has undergone. That's, I guess, where they're coming from. And all of this happened very rapidly over the weekend. It kind of, unless you live in Columbia, this kind of caught you out of nowhere. As I say, I'm an hour and a half away, and I'm on campus every couple of weeks because I'm a seasoned football ticket holder. And I had no idea there were any controversies like this even going on. I, this all hit me out of nowhere. So when I start seeing the, the news Sunday, uh, Sunday morning that the football team was uh, going to stop uh, practicing and stop engaging in football activities out of protest. I was like, whoa, whoa, where did all of this come from? First of all, what are you protesting? What are, what's even happening? What's the controversy? What's the protesting? I wanted to do a little research. I wanted to find out a little bit about it because this, this is not the kind of thing that happens every day, folks. And it was so interesting to me that just being an hour and a half away, I had no idea what was going on. Even as someone who is on campus, has been on campus several times this year, I had no idea there was any kind of controversy whatsoever. So I started uh, researching this a little bit and uh, I was kind of puzzled as I went. I, I, could, I learned very quickly that there was an issue with this, uh, or a perceived issue, I guess, with this uh, system president of the university. And that there had, I guess, been some racial issues of some kind, although most every publication I read really didn't talk much about the specific racial issues. So I wasn't really sure what that was, but there was an incident, I guess, at the homecoming parade a couple of weeks back where this concerned students 1950 group physically surrounded this president's car demanding a meeting. And he basically wouldn't give them a meeting. And that was kind of what blew the whole thing up. I read that and I'm scratching my head. I'm like, okay, wait a second. Y'all wanted a meeting with this president by physically surrounding his car, threatening him, intimidating him, basically. And you're surprised he doesn't give it to you. And moreover, that's a reason that you want him fired. And you're willing to cut class and cut football practice to protest it. Really? Man, that didn't make a lot of sense to me. So I kept researching it and reading about it. And as I read about it, I kept getting more and more puzzled because again, I'm looking for whatever the specific incidents were that really launched this. To me, just a, a university president not meeting with you doesn't seem to be enough to warrant this kind of, of action or this kind of behavior. So I'm, I'm reading through it thinking, okay, whatever these racial incidents were, they must've been pretty bad and man, I'm looking for a real doozy in here somewhere. And I, I couldn't find anything. Everything I read, at least at first on Sunday morning, when they would uh, get quotes from these student protesters, it was always stuff like, well, we're protesting the, the, the racism on campus. We're protesting the injustice on campus. Okay, well, let's get some specifics. What racism? What injustice? Very few people really mention much about what specific incidents there were. It took some digging. It took a lot of reading. I was doing this most of the day Sunday afternoon trying to figure it out. And as I went along, I did get some clarification on it. Evidently, there had been a few isolated incidents around campus where uh, maybe racial slurs had been used from, from whites towards blacks. Okay, that's not a good thing, but that's it? Really? That's all? And there was a particularly disturbing incident with feces and a swastika in a dorm room. Okay, it was pretty bad. But really, most of this stuff didn't seem like, dare I say it, that big of a deal. It wasn't like there were professors that were denying grades to blacks or grading them on a separate scale or people being denied entrance into certain classes or majors. That's what I was expecting. And like, none of that was there. It was just, hey, some drunk guy in a pickup truck called you the N-word. That's all it was. Like, wow, this, it started to hit me that this controversy very quickly seemed to blow out of proportion. Now, let me, uh, before I go any further, let me clarify my background on this. I'm not just some random guy talking about this. 
I am an alumnus of the University of Missouri. I am a graduate of the University of Missouri. Graduated in 1996. As I mentioned, I'm a seasoned football ticket holder as well. So the fact that football players are not engaging in uh, football activities and potentially missing practices and games, okay, that affects me maybe a little bit more than it would the average person. So I took particular interest in this story. And as I had mentioned earlier, was surprised and kind of horrified that this became such a big deal out of really so little. I couldn't help but think back to Ferguson a year ago. And of course, you know, Mizzou's just 110 miles away from, from St. Louis. So, you know, when Ferguson went down last year, a lot of those same students, some of them come from that area. Some of them have friends in those areas. Some of them had friends that probably were involved in that mess. Some of them themselves might have even been involved in, in, involved in that looting and setting fires and stealing and crime and all that was going on there. Likely some of those folks were there. And it struck me that Ferguson is also something very similar, something kind of small and really ordinary. I mean, uh, someone robs a liquor store they're confronted by the police. They get into an altercation with the police and the police defend themselves and kill them. That's not exactly, not exactly groundbreaking stuff. That's ordinary. That's kind of what's supposed to happen. And yet instantly people came out of the woodwork around that neighborhood, blocked off the street so that the coroner couldn't get through and, and police couldn't get through and so forth. And it lit this fuse into a big national thing. I, I view that as very similar to what happened to Mizzou. Some guy in a pickup truck, probably drunk, uses the N-word and somebody makes a big stink about it. And I'm not defending using the N-word. But again, I'm looking at the big picture and thinking, really? That Of all the things you could protest, that's, that's what you're going to spend your time on? So yes, I'm an alumnus of Mizzou. And... As I heard people talk, the protesters talk about this over the weekend, I heard them invoke quite often the long-term racial issues at this university. Long-term racial issues. Now, before some of you critics start telling me that I don't know what I'm talking about, or that I'm not educated on the long-term racial blah, blah, blah at Mizzou, you'd best understand one thing. My freshman year at Mizzou in 1992, fall semester, the very first class that I took, the very first class that I sat in at 8.40 a.m. on, I believe it was a Monday morning, first class I attended as a college student was a American History 1865 to present course taught by a gentleman named Arvar Strickland. Now, some of you, that, that name probably doesn't mean a lot to most of you out there, but to those of you, any of you listening who are protesting this stuff, some of you who are in the Legion of Black Collegians or some of you who are in the Black Studies program, you certainly will know who Professor Arvar Strickland was. He was the first black professor employed by the University of Missouri. Now, I had no idea of this when I went into the class, I just signed up for an American history class. I didn't, you know, didn't know anything about the professors, just signed up for a class at a convenient time. And Mr. Strickland's class was that class. And as I went through Arvar Strickland's class, I noticed subtly that he spent an awful lot of time and an awful lot of attention in that class talking about race talking about racial issues. So yes, I we spent a lot of time talking about Lloyd Gaines. You people in the Legion of Black Collegians and Black Studies program, you'll know exactly who he is and you know his, his struggles in being a law student and wanting to come to Mizzou and so forth. Yeah, Mr. Strickland spent a lot of time on that. Mr. Strickland had us read, reading uh, books by uh, Richard Wright, Native Son, we had to read that. And when we got to the 60s, oh yes, so much of it was about the racial struggle, oh yes. And he would always, give him credit, he would always tie these 
stories of race in America back to the University of Missouri or, or even our local area. While I today disagree with his emphasis on that, at least I give him credit for tying it into us locally and, and, and making it interesting in that respect. Clearly he did that. Now again, I didn't know at the time that Strickland was the first black professor and was a big part of the black studies program. I didn't even know what a black studies program was then. But as I look back now, clearly a lot of that influenced his class. So all of the things that you're going to tell me about how awful the race relations supposedly have been at Mizzou, I'm pretty sure I can tell you, yeah, I've already heard them. I'm familiar. I'm familiar with Lloyd Gaines. I'm familiar with all of those things. I'm even familiar, speaking of the football program, with the 1950s when Dan Devine came here to coach the team. And when he took a stand and uh, prior to that, people would bring Confederate flags to the football games and wave them. This is like 60 years before we had the controversy in South Carolina. And Devine got that, uh, that stopped. The band, the marching band would play Dixie when we would score a touchdown up until the 1950s. Dan Devine got that stopped. And in doing so, kind of created an environment where uh, Mizzou was able to start recruiting black football players uh, early on. I'm familiar with all of that. So I know kind of where this is all coming from. But when I look at the history of racial relations at the University of Missouri, that so many of you right now are invoking, I even heard, I believe it was the student body president, if I'm not mistaken, on television the other day talking about how this all goes back to Missouri being a slave state. Seriously? Really? Is there one person alive in 2015 who owned a slave? Is there one person alive in 2015 who's ever been a slave? I didn't think so. But I'm familiar with all the history you're trying to put upon this. But as I look in 2015, I don't see a connection to any of that past. When I look in 2015 and I hear of collegians at the modern day University of Missouri invoking the year 1950 and saying that they are standing up for racism and the, the, the problems that black students have had ever since 1950. I got to stop and think. What have blacks endured since 1950? Well, an awful lot of what blacks have experienced at the University of Missouri since 1950 and today is not much different than what the rest of us experienced. Since 1950, blacks have been able to achieve the same valuable education at the University of Missouri that all the rest of us have. Since 1950, Blacks have been able to take advantage of the same beautiful campus that all the rest of us have. Since 1950, blacks have been able to take advantage of all of the technology and the infrastructure and the buildings and all of the things that have always been a little a step ahead of the curve at Mizzou compared to everything else. They've gotten to experience all of that just like we have. World-class education, world-class facilities, world-class technology, world-class equipment, world-class everything. And blacks have been able to, uh, black students since 1950 have been able to take advantage of every bit of that that we have. Blacks have been able to live in the same accommodations that all of the rest of us have. Blacks have been able to earn, they weren't given, they earned the very same degrees that all the rest of us did. That's what blacks since 1950 have endured. But what about the racial slurs? What about all these incidents? Well, let's put it into perspective. None of those things are good if they happened. I'll grant you that. But in all of the research I did on this, I didn't run across anything that said that 
that there were not ongoing investigations or procedures in place being followed in any of these incidents. It's not as though these things got swept under the rug. It just seems that these protesters are a little bit angry about maybe how long it's taking or not getting the specific result they wanted. Facts be damned. Again, not unlike Ferguson. I wonder how many of these people have looked off 120 miles in the east when perpetrating this whole thing. I haven't seen any evidence to this point that said that those incidents have been ignored or they weren't followed up on or they were swept under the rug or that people were told not to talk about it. I haven't seen that at all. If someone has that information, please let me know. I would be most, most interested to see it. I might even change my opinion if, if you have it. So no, it's not a positive thing, but there's also no indication that it's not being handled. But there again, let's put it all into perspective. Let's be honest. What is a university supposed to do? A university is supposed to prepare young men and women to be functional, successful, contributing adults in the real world. Now, in the real world, once you leave college, and I can tell you this having been in the real world for almost two decades since I graduated, in the real world, people are going to hate you for any number of reasons. And yes, potentially your skin color might be one of those reasons. But I've got news for you. You're not the only people that that happens to. People are going to hate you for any number of reasons. Some people might hate you because you're black. Guess what? There are people out there that hate me because I'm white. People might hate you because of your religion. I know people hate me because I'm a Christian. People might hate you because of your socioeconomic status. People might hate you because of geography of where you come from. People might hate you because you're short, because you're tall, because you engage in a business they don't like. There is a countless and endless list of reasons for human beings to hate each other. And there's no amount of education in the world, no amount of legislation in the world that's going to stop that. But if a purpose of a college, a purpose of a university is to prepare you to be successful when you go out into this real world, then one of the things you're going to have to be prepared for is how to have success in spite of those who hate you for whatever reason that might be. How to rise above that, focus on yourself, focus on your family, and get the job done. You know, I don't even know if, these, if, if this racial slur thing even happened by a student. We don't even know that. Chances are, there's a good chance anyway, that the drunk in the pickup truck that used the N-word at you, that he's probably, he's not a student. He may be going back home to his trailer somewhere, kicking back on his, on his ratty old recliner, watching a black and white TV, drinking a natural light, and that's as good as life's ever going to get for him. Here, you're in college, you're putting a, a future together for yourself, and five years from now, you will have blown him away. So why waste your time on it? See... <coughs> Excuse me. These protesters are talking about safe spaces and triggers and microaggressions and all of that. I got news for you. When you get in the real world, there are no safe spaces. You're going to have to deal with people. Deal with people different than you. Deal with people that hate you for whatever reason. Deal with people that try to obstruct you in every business you go into. And you're going to have to overcome them and whip their asses. Not physically, but in terms of your success. The good thing is you're at a university where you, if you focus on the right things, can learn how to do just that. But you can't do it if you waste your time there focusing on every little offense, every little, every little niggly problem that comes up. A couple of good men lost their jobs today, the university president and the chancellor, because you people got a little butt hurt and you lost sight of what's truly important in college. And worse yet, because you were successful in some way, you have furthered the false narrative that 
that we've seen since Ferguson in this nation, the false narrative that blacks are unable to succeed in America by playing by the rules, by playing through the system. Instead, you felt like you had to use physical intimidation, work outside the system, and force something to happen. Now, are you going to go in the real world and try that? Because good luck, it ain't going to work. You're in for a rude awakening. And as for you players, you are paid to play football. That's what your scholarship is for. You have an opportunity that many young men and women your age would literally kill for. And I don't even mean on the football side of it. I mean just the fact that you're getting a world-class education paid for. Many of you come from places where the people you grew up with have no chance of that, and you have it. And you're willing to squander it for a little bit of so-called social justice, a concept that doesn't exist. You know, I respect the players and the coaching staff for what they do on the field, but I do not respect the stand that they took here. And if they keep this kind of thing up, if they take another stand like this, if they keep speaking out on things like this, you're going to lose a lot of support from the rest of the state, not from the media, maybe not from St. Louis and Kansas City, but in real Missouri, in rural Missouri, you will. And it could crumble this program to its knees. You all better think about that. You better think about where your bread is buttered before you take too many more of these stands. Folks, we're going to expand the discussion here after the break to the concepts of bigotry and discrimination in general. It's going to be a discussion that if you listen to it, a whole lot of people are going to be talking about going forward. That's after the break. This is Travis Cook. We'll see you in just a moment. Stuff them up yourself if you don't love Jesus. 